Well, good morning. Got a special treat today. Um, over the next year, we'll be embarking on quarterly lectures on basic science and advanced surgical research. We plan uh, to have guest speakers from the southeastern United States and also in areas that we're attuned to, uh, academic centers that lead in surgical research. So we'll have innovators and researchers that'll be coming hopefully every quarter to give us kind of a pep talk, things to get us going on our research as, as we need to. As you know, research should lead to innovation. It's not really a paper you write to keep on the shelves or it, to burn away in the past. If it doesn't lead to innovation, research is basically blind. There's been several people in, in my career, and, and everyone in here can name people in their career that led them to, to novel ideas and thoughts, and you really thought that they were the innovators of surgical technique and ideas. Some of those, some of, you, some of them you love, some of them you hate. Dr. Edwin Deitch, one of the guys who basically trained Dr. Brown and Dr. Zabari and I, had an idea that bacteria can move from the intestinal mucosa. Dr. Satig was actively involved in his research also to the and stage itself in the, G, in the mesenteric lymph nodes and would enter the bloodstream. And we were taking out lymph nodes from trauma patients in the middle of the night and submitting them to Dr. Deitch. I thought that was innovative, that it could lead to changes in our care, could, could make patients better. Dr. Paul Ebert and Dr. Bill Gay, I, I, I know uh, Dr. Griffin knows Dr. Ebert, inter, they innovated cardioplegia, stop the heart which made heart, open heart surgery much more amenable to everyone in the United States. Dr. Bill Norwood, I think Dr. Brown knows too, at Children's Hospital in Philadelphia was an innovator, not just a researcher of hypoplastic left heart and actually invented operations like detransposition repair with the arterial switch. And then Robert Jarvik I worked with at the University of Utah lab who was the innovator of the artificial heart. So today we've got a special treat uh, with Dr. Laramore. He's, he's also been and has some of the great people in the southeast that he's done research with and also abroad is going to talk about cancer genetics and the surgical scientist. Thank you very much. Good morning. I, I just want to say at the outset how excited I am to have joined your faculty. I felt welcomed by everyone uh, and I, uh, I'm passionate about what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to start the, the first half of the talk is going to have to do with the multiple endocrine neoplasia syndromes and the research that I did on that. For now, about 30 years, uh, I've been interested in that syndrome. But then I'm going to uh, transition into talking about the importance of surgical mentors in our, in our career development, and then about the, the outlook for the surgical scientist and whether or not we might be dinosaurs and uh, how, we, uh, how we need to respond to that. Uh, I, I didn't put I have no conflicts. I have no, nothing to disclose. I'm seriously conflicted, but I don't have anything to disclose. So why should a surgeon study uh, the genetics of a cancer syndrome? Well, multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1 and type 2 all involve uh, disease entities that are treated surgically. Cancer is a genetic disease. So uh, the transformation of a cell from the normal phenotype to a malignant cell has been shown to be a stepwise accumulation of genetic defects that, that basically render the cell unresponsive to or independent of its normal growth signals. So the hallmark of cancer then is uncontrolled growth of the cell. And this can either uh, be caused by oncogenic changes that are dominantly acting, meaning that an oncogene is mutated and drives the, the growth of the cell, or uh, by the loss of the normal controls or breaking on cell growth. Uh, now if you look at the multiple endocrine neoplasia syndromes, type 1 and type 2, they show examples of both types of, of genetic uh, abnormality. MEN2 is a mutation, uh, it's a dominantly acting mutation in the RET proto-oncogene. Uh, multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1 results from the loss of a tumor suppressor gene, the menin gene. So why, why is it important to study these rare syndromes, hereditary syndromes? Uh, they're, very, they're very rare, we don't see them frequently, they result in this uh, very odd constellation of unusual tumors, but the important thing to realize is that the specific mutations that occur in the germline that result in these very rare uh, hereditary cancer syndromes are the same mutations that occur sporadically in the common tumors that we take care of. 
So I just want to talk about, if you think about the landmark achievements that surgeons have, uh, have been involved in in the past last 200 years or so in the, the development of the clinical practice of surgery, they include many of those that are listed here. Uh, successfully taking out a large ovarian mass on a kitchen table on a lady on Christmas Day on a lady who rode on a horse about 14 miles and there was no anesthesia when, when uh, uh, Ephraim McDowell took this out to rapid life-saving amputation in the Civil War uh, to uh, advances in vascular anastomosis or operating on the, uh, the non-beating heart and finally transplantation in the more current era many of you are aware that Current evidence shows that sleeve gastrectomy or Ruan Y gastric bypass actually can show, uh, cause a more durable cure of type 2 diabetes than intensive medical therapy. There's been a randomized controlled trial now in the, the New England Journal of Medicine that supports that. But I'd like to add to that surgery to prevent the development of cancer. So Wells, and uh, who was my mentor, uh, define surgery to prevent cancer as the preemptive operative removal of an organ prior to malignant transformation or, or while the cancer is still in situ. So if you think about multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2, it's, I'm, I want to convince you that it's actually an archetype model of a disease where you can actually remove the end organ, the target organ that, that is at risk to develop cancer prior to cancer ever developing there or prior to it spreading to the lymph nodes. And this is, this is really, a, this is a landmark achievement of surgeons. So the story of, of multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2 really begins with this cell, the thyroid uh, parafollicular cell, or C cell, uh, shown here stained with an immunoperoxidase stain for calcitonin. So it's really remarkable to me that medullary thyroid carcinoma was not really recognized as a separate pathologic type of thyroid cancer until 1959, when a couple of uh, pathologists uh, at, uh, in Cleveland basically described a subset of thyroid cancers that had a more solid, or what they call medullary, appearance under the microscope. But these, these tumors clearly had a poorer prognosis than the typical uh, follicular thyroid cancers. And then, uh, really, this uh, I think it just highlights how a basic clinical observation can be very important. John Sippel was an internist, actually a pulmonologist in Syracuse, New York, and when he was a medical student, like many of you sitting in this front row, he made a very important observation when doing uh, chart reviews that the incidence of thyroid cancer in patients that had pheochromocytoma was about 30 times higher than the normal population. And this association, of course, of pheochromocytoma and thyroid cancer is the multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2 syndrome, sometimes called Sipple's syndrome. Now, he did not recognize, however, that the specific type of thyroid cancer was medullary thyroid cancer. So the features of multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2A then, uh, almost all patients that, develop, that inherit the mutation will develop medullary thyroid carcinoma. They develop it early in life. It's bilateral in the thyroid lobes, and it's multifocal. Uh, a smaller percentage of these patients will develop pheochromocytomas, which can be bilateral. And then the most variable component of the syndrome is hyperparathyroidism. Just some examples here. This is a, a, a sectioned thyroid specimen from a patient with MEN2 and medullary thyroid carcinoma. Notice that the deposits of MTC are bilateral, and they're multifocal within the thyroid gland. They're also clustered in the middle and upper thirds of the thyroid lobe, and that corresponds to the distribution of the C cells within the thyroid. If you look at these cells under the microscope, uh, they have the typical uh, cords and trabeculae and uh, small blue cells of a neuroendocrine tumor, but there's this curious uh, amyloid-like stroma that surrounds the cells of medullary thyroid carcinoma. It's actually, it's, it looks like amyloid. It's negatively birefringent under polarized light, like amyloid is. But it's actually not amyloid. It turns out to be a polymer of pre-procalcitonin. These patients also develop pheochromocytomas of the adrenal glands that can be bilateral and uh, in a subset of patients. And they also develop hyperparathyroidism. Now, uh, in spite of what you might read in the textbooks, uh, it turns out that hyperparathyroidism is usually not multiglandular in MEN type 2. It's very frequently a uh, one or, or perhaps a double adenoma. Uh, 
This is a, a young man with uh, MEN type 2 who had a, a large mediastinal thyroid abnormal. The MEN 2B syndrome is much more rare. It also uh, involves a medullary thyroid carcinoma, which can develop earlier in life than an MEN 2A. These children can get it in the first decade of life, and it can become metastatic. They also get pheochromocytomas, which can be bilateral. And then they also develop uh, mucosal neuromata, uh, and actually hypertrophy of the neural tissue throughout the body. Uh, and they have a characteristic phenotype. Now, this is not true of MEN 2A. But patients with MEN2B have, a, a, I'll show you their characteristic appearance. What is not present here, if you not want to know, it's a common uh, question on exams, is hyperparathyroidism is not part of the MEN2B syndrome. So these patients, uh, they have a characteristic uh, body habitus, which has been described as Marfanoid, although they don't have Marfan syndrome. They have uh, hyperflexibility of their joints. They can develop uh, hip problems. They have dental abnormalities and a broad mid-face. And they develop these multiple bumps on their tongue. If you look at them under the microscope, they're actually sort of tangled, disordered arrays of, uh, of nerve fibers, uh, plexiform neuroma. And uh, these uh, actually know both of these MEN2B patients. At one time, I probably knew about half the patients with MEN2B in the entire country because I traveled around screening them. But if you want to get hit, uh, you ask a, an MEN2B patient to stick their tongue out. They really don't like to do that. So if you look at, the, at these under the microscope, this just shows that if you look at a section of the bowel, there's also hypertrophy of the uh, submucosal and myenteric plexi in the bowel. They even have hypertrophied corneal nerves under slit lamp examination. Slit lamp examination. And then there's a syndrome called familial medullary thyroid carcinoma where patients develop only the medullary thyroid carcinoma in an autosomal dominant fashion, but they don't get the associated endocrinopathies of hyperparathyroidism and pheochromocytoma. Now, many of you have seen this image before uh, in this phrase. Uh, when you see a turtle on top of a fence post, chances are he did not get there on his own. This is commonly uh, credited to uh, the author, Alex Haley, although uh, in looking at this carefully, I think the, the author is actually unknown. But uh, I think uh, Courtney Townsend of Galveston was also very, very uh, frequently quoted this. But it just speaks to the fact that the importance of uh, the influence of our mentors on us and our development. So mentorship actually has its origins back in ancient Greece, which is a technique that was uh, important to sort of impart important social, spiritual, and personal values to young men. Uh, today, it's, it's modeled uh, largely on the historical craftsman and apprenticeship and apprentice uh, relationship. But the goal of mentoring is to provide professional and personal development, and I think it's critically important in surgery. Uh, almost all of us, I think, can point to the profound influence that key teachers and mentors have had on our personal development. These are three of mine. Uh, my father, Larry Larimore, who graduated from uh, high school uh, with 20, 20 students in it from Dewar, Oklahoma, the only person from that high school to go to college. Uh, worked uh, nights, went to school during the day, became a petroleum engineer, successful. Uh, William Hillis, a distinguished professor of biology at Baylor University, probably is the reason that I went into medicine. He got his medical degree at Johns Hopkins and studied uh, hepatitis B in Africa, in the Congo and was uh, very instrumental and in, laid the groundwork for the, uh, what ultimately resulted in a vaccine for hepatitis B. And then uh, John McDonald, a pioneering transplant surgeon, as you know, born in Baldwin, Mississippi in 1930, the chairman of the department here for, I think, 23 years, and then became the first dean and chancellor. He was enormously influential in my personal development. And then this man, a very intense individual right here. This, this, uh, those eyes looked at me a lot of times across the operating table and dropped a, a, a brick on me. Dr. Sam Wells was uh, the chairman of surgery at Washington University in St. Louis, and he assembled this team of uh, researchers that really he set out in the late 1980s. With, he had the goal of identifying the gene that causes multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2. And I've told you that all of the uh, disease entities that occur, are, they're all treated surgically. Majority thyroid carcinoma, pheochromocytomas, hyperparathyroidism. Uh, 
And so Dr. Jim Howe was a resident in the, uh, in the research lab with me. He, uh, Jim and I did a, a large amount of the work, certainly not independently, but um, a large amount of the work that ultimately resulted in identification of the ret proto-oncogene mutations that cause MEN2. Uh, Dr. Jeff Moley, my division director, also a researcher, and then Helen Donis Keller, who was a basic scientist, uh, PhD geneticist. So this uh, is the uh, map of chromosome 10 in about the late 1980s when I became involved in, uh, in the research that uh, was led to, to, uh, to identifying mutations. Uh, it was known at that time that the disease gene for MEN2 uh, was located somewhere near the centromere of human chromosome 10. Uh, between the genes for uh, retinol binding protein and fibronectin beta receptor, RBP3 and FNRB. And they flanked this relatively large expanse of DNA around the centromere region of human chromosome 10. So at that time, back in the late 80s and early 90s, human disease genes were identified by what is called positional cloning, which means that we sought to identify a gene without knowing anything about the protein coding of the gene only its location on the chromosome. And we basically, the strategy at that time, this was prior to sequencing the entire human genome, which occurred in 1994. Uh, we would basically try to clone up large amounts of DNA and then search for uh, coding sequen sequences within that. Once we identified a gene, it was a very uh, a laborious process to try to look for mutations that were associated with the disease phenotype. So I set out. Uh, after completing uh, my initial part of my residency, I went to the research lab and I wound up staying there for three years. I stayed there the third year. I, I basically begged my chairman to let me stay a third year because I accomplished more in the third year than I did in the first two years combined. So basically the strategy was going to be to try to clone up this region of human chromosome 10. Uh, and we utilized what's called a YAC or a yeast artificial chromosome. This technology was developed by Eric Green and Maynard, Nolson, uh, Maynard Olson. He's actually been up for the Nobel Prize several times. He probably will get it before the end of his uh, lifetime or perhaps after he's uh, deceased. But basically what, what they came up with was a way to try to propagate or clone very large segments of human DNA. So most, most cloning mechanisms like plasmids uh, in E. coli can only uh, uh, clone segments of DNA that are in the kilobase size. But Dr. Olson had this idea of partially digesting human DNA and generating these fragments that were very large, that were even up to a megabase in size, and then cloning them into a, a vector which basically had a yeast telomere uh, tacked to both ends and a yeast centromere. And then he actually found a way to sort of propagate these large clones as an extra chromosome, an added chromosome within the yeast cell, or a YAC, a yeast artificial chromosome. I don't know if that makes sense to you. But this slide right here, uh, which was a paper that I published in the uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, represents about three solid years of work in the research lab. I basically pulled out a, a number of these uh, YAC clones from a human library. There was a human genomic library at Washington University that covered, uh, represented the human genome about five times. And we tried to pull out YACs, and then I spent time uh, ordering them in an overlapping uh, ordered physical uh, map or contig that spanned this entire region of, of chromosome 10. And then based on two very critical meiotic crossover events, when we uh, looked at the way the gene uh, was transmitted through multiple generations, we found in very large numbers of patients two critical crossovers. And one of those uh, demonstrated that the gene had to be to the right of D10S94 and the other crossover demonstrated that it had to be to the left of D10S141. So we knew that the disease gene had to be within this 500 KB interval uh, of, within my content. Shortly after I left the lab, uh, after the third year, uh, the RET proto-oncogene was identified within this 500 KB uh, interval and was shown to harbor mutations that cause the multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2 gene. Now this just shows kind of uh, schematically that there can be multiple mutations within this gene. Uh, shown here are the different codons that can be mutated. And there's actually a variety of uh, patterns of, of uh, phenotypic expression that you can get. 
The most common mutations cause MEN2A, which as I've uh, shown you causes medullary thyroid carcinoma, hyperparathyroidism, and pheochromocytomas. There are other mutations that can cause a subset of familial Hirschsprung's disease, uh, cutaneous lichen amyloidosis, and then the rare mutations that occur in the catalytic uh, domain of the gene cause multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2B. This is the, uh, for historical purposes, this is the actual audio radiograph uh, that was, uh, this experiment was actually ran by my, uh, by my lab tech, Shen Shen Do, who's now an artist in Seattle. She paints. But this is the original audio radiograph that showed the mn 2 b mutation. Uh, if you can see here, uh, the, uh, basically the mutation is, changes an ATG, or, which codes for a methionine, to an ACG, which codes for a threonine. And uh, both the T and the C are present here because you have contributions of both uh, parents here. But you can see that there are two bands at this position where there should just be one. So right there on that gel, that's, that's where we identified the mn 2 b mutation. This actually allowed us to uh, do direct mutational analysis uh, to identify whether or not a patient had inherited the mutation. And at that time, this was basically done by PCR amplification. And then if the actual uh, gene change had occurred, it created a, a restriction endonuclease site, which would then cleave the DNA and result in multiple bands. So this just shows an example of the genetic testing that we ran in the laboratory on a kindred of patients. Uh, the smaller band here has run off the, uh, of the gel, but you can see that any, any of these patients that has two bands are affected. So there's an affected grandparent here with two bands, affected person with two bands, affected with two bands. You can see that in this uh, bottom generation, you can, it's quite readily uh, uh, evident who has harbored the mutation and who does not. So let's get back to why this is important then. Why did we want to try to identify the mutations in the MEN2 gene? Well, it, it really became, I think I can uh, convince you by the end of this talk, one of the first and probably still the best models of a human disease process where we can identify a mutation and then make a surgical intervention uh, that's aimed at uh, abrogating the risk of cancer. Now there are other examples now, including uh, total colectomy for familial adenomatous polyposis. Uh, very much in the news recently is uh, prophylactic uh, mastectomies for patients that harbor BCRA1 and 2 mutations. But MEN2 was really the first and still probably the purest model of this. So uh, what are the key features then of the management of hereditary forms of medullary carcinoma based on genetic testing? Uh, it's recommended that you do a total thyroidectomy as well as a removal of all the central lymph nodes in the neck. The management of parathyroid glands is somewhat controversial. Dr. Wells taught us to take all of them out and uh, auto-transplant them to a heterotopic position. This might be a little aggressive for patients with MEN2, uh, but that's a matter of controversy that's beyond the scope of this talk. For most patients with MEN2, it's recommended that they have their thyroid removed around age five, and I'll show you the evidence that, that basically resulted in that recommendation. Patients with MEN2B should actually be operated on as soon as the diagnosis is recognized, even in the first year of life. That's because they have very aggressive medullary carcinoma and can have metastases in the first decade. The youngest patient I've operated on with MEN2B was eight months old. This just shows that you want to uh, do a very thorough central lymph node dissection. See here the trachea and the recurrent laryngeal nerve here. Um, well, Dr. Wells taught us to be meticulous about cleaning out all the lymphatic tissue in the central compartment of the neck. Now, Dr. Wells uh, basically um, promoted this group of residents that went into the lab, recruited Helen Donis Keller, a PhD geneticist, and uh, successfully identified the gene for immune 2 but he took that information to be the first to actually show what the benefits were of operating on these children early to remove their thyroid gland. And this paper, published in the New England Journal of Medicine from Dr. Wells' group, actually uh, studied the first 50 patients that, were, that underwent surgery, early surgery or preventative surgery, based on a genetic mutation. And typical of Dr. Wells, he had 100% follow-up on these 50 patients, and they were followed for almost 10 years. And this study really shows uh, the benefits of this. It, it's the landmark paper of the benefits of taking out the thyroid gland. Basically, had 50 consecutive patients that had a, a ret mutation. 
Their ages were from 3 to 19 with a mean of 10. He did a standard operation in all of these patients. I operated on some of the patients in this group. Uh, we performed a total thyroidectomy and a central uh, zone lymphadenectomy on all the patients. All of these patients had a total parathyroidectomy and a heterotopic autotransplant. That was Dr. Wells' protocol. And he studied them uh, five to 10 years after their thyroidectomy with a mean of seven years. And again, he had 100%, these patients were from all over the country, but uh, Dr. Wells got 100% follow-up. And the important thing is that he studied them with stimulated plasma calcitonin levels. So basal cal calcitonin is a good tumor marker for the recurrence of medullary carcinoma. But, but if you stimulate them with a secretagogue, calcium and pentagastrin, uh, even patients with undetectable basal levels can have uh, evident microscopic disease. So Dr. Wells' definition of cure was very rigorous. He wanted patients to have a, an undetectable, stimulated calcitonin level after the surgery. This just shows the results of that study. If you look at how many patients uh, of these 50 had evident microscopic or macroscopic medullary carcinoma, Almost 70% of them had already had cancers. These were operated on in the first decade of life. Uh, 11 of them had C-cell hyperplasia, which is the pre-neoplastic change they get before medullary carcinoma. Four of them, only 8%, had no evidence of disease, but it, this is simply because they were operated on uh, early enough that they didn't have the, the changes yet. And in, this is what's important here. In Dr. Wells' original 50 patients, three of these patients already had lymph node metastases around age 10 or 11. Subsequent studies showed several patients who had lymph node metastases in the uh, six to eight range. So this is where the evidence comes uh, to operate on patients at age five, uh, because the earliest lymph node metastases occur around uh, six, eight, somewhere in the latter part of the first decade. Uh, why do we wait till age five? Many endocrinologists have concern about taking the thyroid gland out and replacing Synthroid in a younger child. It's very important for neurological development. Those of you who have children know it's a lot harder to get a uh, three-year-old to take their medicine than it is to get a six-year-old to take their medicine. Uh, now this is the summary of, of how many patients were cured. So with a very, very rigorous definition of cure, meaning that they had undetectable stimulated calcitonin levels, Almost 90% of these patients with 10 years of follow-up had undetectable calcitonin levels and were therefore cured. Uh, another 8% had stimulated levels that were detectable. They were still within the normal range, but they were detectable, which, it, which showed evidence that they had some uh, C cell mass still left in the body. Maybe not tumorous, but C cells left. And then 4% uh, had stimulated levels that were above normal. So probably 90 to 95% of patients with 10 years of follow-up were cured after this operation. Uh, this just shows an example of the stimulated calcitonin levels. This is the, uh, the normal male. If you stimulate them with calcium and pentagastrin, which are secretagogues for calcitonin, there's a timed increase and then fall in calcitonin. And this just shows a patient that was operated on uh, immediately following the surgery. They had undetectable levels and six years later, undetectable stimulated levels. What about hypoparathyroidism, permanent hypocalcemia? Uh, Dr. Wells's rate of permanent hypocalcemia uh, was 6% uh, in the study. Uh, and so this has been criticized as a slightly high range. That's why there's controversy now about whether to take out all the parathyroids and transplant them in MEM2. Uh, but you can see here that five patients had to be uh, on calcium and vitamin D, two of those in yellow were subsequently six months later uh, off of all calcium and vitamin D replacements, leaving only three patients dependent on replacements. Now the only significant factors that were related to whether or not patients were cured or not were the uh, age at the time of their thyroidectomy and whether or not they already had lymph node metastases. Again, this is the basis of the recommendation for operating on patients at the age of around five. Now, uh, I was privileged to be part of a uh, uh, I was the chair of the American Association of uh, Clinical Endocrinologists Consensus Group, which made recommendations in 2015 on the appropriate timing of thyroidectomy and extent of lymphadenectomy in patients with MEN type 2. It's a very busy slide, but it just summarizes uh, the different mutations that occur according to the exon and codon in the gene, and then the phenotypic expression of whether they get medullary carcinoma, hyperparathyroidism, or pheos 
but the important thing is that there are four risk categories. The highest risk category is category D, which is the imian 2 b mutation. It occurs in the catalytic intracellular domain of the RET, and it basically confers the most aggressive, biologically aggressive disease. These patients you should operate on very, very early, as I said, even in the first year of life. The intermediate mutations are the imian 2 a mutations, B group categories B and C, and then there are some mutations uh, in, in risk level A which are quite indolent. You can look at large uh, families and uh, there's no deaths from the disease. They develop their medullary carcinoma much later in life and they don't tend to really uh, have life-limiting disease. So there's controversy about how early to operate on those patients. So this just summarizes our, our uh, consensus uh, recommendations. Because of the rarity of the disease, some of these were based on best expert opinion rather than evidence-based data. But you can see here for the highest uh, the highest level, the immune 2 b mutations, recommended a total thyroidectomy in the first six months of life, and they should have a central lymph node dissection or even a lateral dissection if they have positive nodes. The level, the intermediate levels, B and C, these are the common immune 2 a mutations. Uh, total thyroidectomy, uh, uh, about age five years of life, you should take the central lymph nodes out. I showed you that in the first decade of life, these patients can develop lymph node metastases. For the lowest level, there's a variety of codons here. Uh, controversy remains about the timing of thyroidectomy and a central lymph node dissection is not necessarily required in these patients. Now this just shows the, uh, uh, how, how sort of demanding it can be to do a preventative thyroidectomy on a, on a five-year-old. This is just a slide from a, uh, these are silk sutures, these are, these are actually four O silk sutures here. You can see how big the knots appear. Uh, this is a, this is a uh, mini Wheatlander retractor here. So we do this to a, a small incision. The thyroid lobe is rotated medially. You can see the recurrent nerve in a five-year-old here as that typical uh, uh, epineural nerve. And you can see the, I don't know if it projects well, but the inferior parathyroid gland is located here. Uh, they're very difficult to find in five-year-olds. They're, they're more translucent. They don't have that golden brown kind of peanut butter color that, that the normal adult parathyroids have. Now, these are two little girls, twin girls that I operated on, uh, and for full disclosure, uh, the mother and the children actually gave full permission for me to show uh, their faces here. Uh, I, I just want you to know it's HIPAA compliant, I guess. Uh, the only way you could tell these two little girls apart is one had uh, no teeth and one had teeth. Uh, I operated on these two uh, girls on the same, they were, they were identical twins, I operated on them on the same day. They had sharing hospital beds here. Uh, in fact, the mother was so happy to give me pictures, she actually gave me a couple more and wanted to be sure I included them. They were, they were very cute. So let's talk about Immune 2 as a model then for an operative uh, intervention that's aimed at trying to prevent or cure cancer. Well, here are the, here are the components that you need, I believe, in order to have uh, a, a disease state that is amenable to an intervention based on a genetic diagnosis. They need to have a strong genetic predisposition to cancer development. If you inherit an MEN type 2 mutation in the rep proto-oncogene, you have essentially a 100% chance of developing medullary thyroid cancer in your life. So they need a strong genetic predisposition. You need to have a diagnostic test that can be performed at any age. The test, the direct mutational test for RET mutations is widely available now. You can order it. It's sent out to, to other uh, outside labs. Uh, but it can be performed from a single venipuncture on any, uh, just from the DNA and peripheral circulating lymphocytes. So it can be performed at any age from a simple venipuncture. The natural history of the disease warrants an invasive surgical procedure that does not carry an inordinate risk of adverse clinical consequences and for which there is no better alternative therapy. Again, I just want to stress that MEN2 is the, it's the ideal model for this. The thyroid gland can be removed entirely surgically and replaced with, with medical therapy. This is not true, for instance, of MEN type 1, where patients get neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas. It's a much more sticky issue. We can't really easily do a total uh, pancreatectomy as a protective uh, operation. So the ability to safely and completely remove the target organ uh, with a high success rate of uh, preventing the subsequent development of invasive cancer. We need to have an effective uh, medical treatment to replace the function of the organ removed. That's true for MEN2. And then a reliable tumor marker to, to detect persistent or recurrent disease. That's calcitonin. 
So in summary then, early preventative thyroidectomy in patients with MEN2 uh, represents one of the first and perhaps still the purest archetype of a cancer syndrome for which an operation is indicated based on a molecular genetic test uh, with the intent of completely removing the target organ. So I, I'm very proud of the fact that I was uh, lucky enough to be involved in the, in the work that identified these mutations. And not only that, but then translating that into the clinical care of children that uh, inherit this disease. Uh, and taking out the thyroid gland, I won't read this quote to you, but I really like this quote by Dr. Halstead, which basically stresses uh, the enormous triumph of taking out the thyroid gland. The, the, the mortality and morbidity from thyroidectomy in the uh, late 19th century was uh, extreme. And so this was a real triumph of surgeons, I think, to, to be able to take out the thyroid gland successfully. Uh, there are normal, a number of very important structures. If you have to take out all of the lymph nodes, you can see here level six, the central lymph nodes, and levels two, three, and four lateral nodes here. Uh, and again, Dr. Wells taught us to be very meticulous in removing all the lymphatic tissue, sparing a number of uh, very critical structures. Now, I want to switch gears now and talk about uh, the future of the, of the surgical scientist and some of the barriers that we have uh, to what I view as a very important component of, of our mission. So uh, I've listed them here, but they include environmental factors, uh, uh, like the length of training and the fact that most uh, medical residents and surgical residents uh, have incurred a large amount of debt. Uh, I'm going to show you data to show that surgeons have disproportionately greater reductions in research support compared with other clinical specialists. As you know, there's decreasing reimbursement to hospitals for postgraduate training positions, and there's a, a real need to balance our clinical responsibilities uh, with this RVU-based uh, compensation that most of us live under with our scholarly pursuits. And then diminishing available resources for the academic department chairman to support research. So let's start with indebtedness and the length of training. Uh, the costs of medical education are staggering. Almost all medical students to depend on scholarships or borrow a large sum of money to complete their education and training. Uh, this data is uh, from uh, the AAMC's uh, graduate questionnaire, which uh, this was taken from data from 2018. Uh, it included uh, 90 public schools and 60 private schools. And you can see here that the 75% uh, of, of uh, students had uh, significant debt. Uh, and if you look at the indebted students only, the mean debt was almost $200,000. Similarly, this is data from Medscape's 2019 resident salary and debt report. Uh, again, from 30 plus specialties of US medical residents. And you can see that almost a quarter of these patients uh, had over 300,000, uh, a quarter of these residents had over $300,000 in debt. And you can see the other various breakdowns here. So medical and surgical residents are are in debt. There's decreasing uh, level of funding that's available currently from the from federal and non-federal sources. And I'm going to show you some data that shows that surgeons are disproportionately affected by this problem. Uh, this data is from a 2017 report of the Basic Science Committee of the Society of University Surgeons. It's from the top 25 uh, medical schools that, re that receive NIH funding. And in, uh, you can see here that there's been a steady decline in NIH funding, uh, and in, in particular in Department of Surgery funding relative to the total funding. This is over the period 2006 to 2014. If you look at Department of Surgery funding relative to Department of Internal Medicine funding, again, there's been a steady decline over the period of time 2006 to 2014. In the bottom panels here, this is the number of basic science abstracts that were submitted to the Academic Surgical Congress. The, the, the time scale is slightly different here from 2011 to 2015. You can see there's a steady decline in the number of basic sciences abstracts that were submitted and of those that were accepted and presented. So we're not pursuing basic science anymore. Uh, in this paper, which was from uh, the University of Virginia, uh, basically these authors looked at data uh, regarding total NIH funding amounts and success rates for all disciplines. Uh, using data from uh, the Blue Ridge Medical Institute, from the NIH, and from FASEB. Uh, they presented this at the Southern Surgical, and it was uh, published in JAXA. And you can see here that although total NIH funding has increased 
from 2006 to 2018. Internal medicine uh, funding has slightly increased, but surgical departmental uh, funding has steadily declined. The total number of research project grants and R01s funded shown, uh, are shown here from 2006 to 2016. You can see here uh, that the total number of funded uh, grants has steadily declined. If you look at the number of applications submitted, it has steadily increased, and the, and the funding success rates, again, are uh, decreasing steadily. Now, uh, what about the funding success rates for uh, Department of Surgery compared to internal medicine? If you see here, uh, surgery is in, is in blue. Uh, it, it also has a, a, a more steep decline in successful funding rates. I think this is an interesting slide, and if, there, if there's any silver lining to this at all, if you look at grant productivity or impact, and this is basically the number and the impact factors of papers that are generated per $100,000 of grant funding. You can see that grant productivity uh, has actually increased, and this is for uh, surgeon scientists. In addition, the conversion of uh, mentored K awards to uh, R-level awards has also steadily increased for surgeons. Uh, and if you look at MD-only grant impact, it has also steadily increased. So even though surgeons are uh, uh, funded less often now, they're more productive when they are funded. Interestingly, the, the most productive funds are those that were given to orthopedic surgeons that were funded and the lowest productivity to breast surgeons. I'm just reporting the results. So what about other, other barriers? Uh, the need to balance our clinical responsibilities uh, and serve us with our scholarly pursuits. And then support and available resources. Uh, this is a report uh, which was a survey of over, was sent out to 2,500 members of the AAS and the SUS, and they asked the following questions. Do considerations around work-life balance have an impact on your ability to do research? And do you feel that your administrative duties uh, negatively impact that or your clinical demands? And it's broken down into whether the response uh, was given by a trainee, a junior, a senior faculty member, or a chairman. And you can see here the percentage of, pay of uh, persons that responded affirmatively to whether this worked like balance. Now, if you look at uh, the reasons that they thought it was uh, restrictive, you can see here that uh, the, the level of the competitiveness for funding was felt to be the major reason that it was restrictive. Then if you look at funded uh, investigators versus non-funded with regard to whether or not they have a current research mentor, whether that mentor reviews their manuscripts or in their grants, uh, you can see that uh, it's much more common for funded investigators to have uh, an important mentor that, is, that they're modeling their grants after and that's helping them with their submissions. What about the perceptions and pressures that reflected negative outlook? Uh, the question was asked here, uh, is it realistic to expect surgeons to be successful basic scientists? And you can see that no was the response of over two-thirds of the uh, respondents. Uh, these were the reasons that it was felt to not be uh, realistic. Time, support, and uh, lower reasons were intrinsic desire or the availability of funding. So what, what do I think the keys are to promoting the development of young surgical scientists? Uh, I've, I've tried to list them here. I took this largely from a paper from my mentor, Dr. Wells. It was published in 1996. It was actually his presidential address to the American Surgical, where he talked about, even, even back in the mid-'90s, he talked about uh, the threatened surgical scientist. I think it's clearly important to have personal qualities of uh, ambition and intellect, but I think it's not enough to just work hard. You have to have the opportunities. I was enormously fortunate to uh, be in the place and time that I was with Dr. Wells in, in that era, uh, where I was able to take advantage of the resources that were available. Uh, I couldn't have done it uh, on an island. So it's important to have the, the commitment and support of key figures, your departmental chairman, uh, other senior faculty members, and mentors. So I think hard work plus opportunity is the recipe for success. Now, concern still exists over uh, whether a clinical investigator can be an effective scientist um, and really compete with those who work full-time in the laboratory or whether or not a clinician uh, that tries to do research can be as effective a clinician. 
I think it's important to remember, though, that defining important questions is best done by those who till the fertile soil of a busy clinical ward. So the PhDs, now, I hope there's none here that are going to throw rocks at me, but they're, they're very smart. We need them, but they chase their tails if, they're, if they don't have the in, input of a, of a clinician to help determine what's important. So I've used a model, especially in the last third of my career, to collaborate with basic scientists uh, as a model for uh, being successful with research. Uh, if you just look about the innovation that clinical investigators, these are just a couple of examples. Uh, Dr. Blaylock, when he was at Vanderbilt and then went to Hopkins, really did the, the seminal initial physiologic studies that led to the treatment of cyanotic heart disease in children. Uh, Evarts Graham, who was uh, at Washington University, had a background in chemistry, and he utilized an idea to develop cholecystography. So basic science background, innovative thinking, and the technical courage to implement our ideas into clinical practice is really the, are the key elements of being successful in research. Now, what are the other barriers that we have to try to, uh, I know you're going to all say, well, that sounds great, Dr. Larimore. We're all going to try to do research. How are we going to do it in today's environment? Uh, there are significant barriers to, uh, to developing an effective research program. They include the intrusion of managed care and uh, on our environment. We're working twice as hard for the same amount or less amount of money now. There's less discretionary revenue available to support research. The uh, RVU-based compensation models don't really have a way to reward scholarly activity. Uh, and there's a disappearance, I think, of our critical mentors that promote a culture uh, for young uh, trainees to, uh, to pursue research. And then final, I've, sh I've shown you the declining uh, NIH funding. Management of our time and effort is extremely difficult. We're tired. We work, we work hard. It's, uh, it's hard uh, to uh, pursue something in the lab when uh, these young surgeons are really anxious to apply their knowledge and their technical skills in the operating room. Uh, but I've, I've met with many of the residents individually, and I think I've tried to stress to you that the key to academic success is really your scholarly work. That's the currency of academic achievement and advancement. Uh, Dr. Francis Moore, who is a recipient of the Medallion for Scientific Achievement, said that the surgical scientist is a bridge tender, channeling knowledge from biological science to the patient's bedside and back again. And then I've also, this is my own thought here, is that I, I think that what we do as surgeons, really, it's a table that stands on three legs. Service to patients is the major part of almost all of our uh, clinical practice. But we have to have the components of education and research, or the enterprise is not sustainable. Uh, this is my strategic plan. I, I briefly introduced it at the faculty meeting. Uh, and I've been uh, talking a lot with Dr. White about uh, how we can try to establish uh, and promote uh, effective research programs within the Department of Surgery. Uh, I won't go through it all, but it, it involves uh, promoting a culture that values that and addressing some of these barriers that I've enumerated. Uh, we'd like to increase our submissions for intramural funding awards, which are available. Uh, and we're going to have a, a large animal facility uh, by 2020. Uh, this is the following slide is, uh, represents the opinions of Terry Lairmore solely. Uh, I, I recently addressed the uh, pre-medical students at Baylor University, a large group of over a couple thousand people in an auditorium. And I tried to come up with what I thought was important to uh, have a successful career in medicine. And that's what I came up with. Uh, one, of, one of the f final things here is to read uh, broadly I learned this from my father-in-law, Dr. McDonald, and it, pursue interests outside of surgery and medicine. You know, there's a, there's a reason that the root word for recreation is to recreate. I think it's important for, and uh, Dr. White gave us this uh, paper, which I read with interest on the joy of surgery, which we're losing. Uh, so I think it's important, as Woody Allen says here, that you have to do something outside of medicine to recreate yourself. Uh, I don't know if you recognize this guy right here, but. Uh, I also play bluegrass music. Uh, I have another hobby, which is high-speed nature photography. Uh, and I actually give a talk on uh, that, but it's probably more interesting than my thyroid cancer talk, but that's not what you've got today. Uh, this is the south rim of uh, the Chisos Mountains uh, in Big Bend National Park. Uh, 
Texas, extreme southern Texas, over looking into Mexico. Uh, are there any questions? I, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for this. It's interesting. I knew Dr. Wells uh, from Dr. Dr. John McDonald's introduction to him, and truly to be on the groundwork of the MEN syndrome, uh, bridging surgery and genetics is, is truly a landmark. It's interesting, when I got here a year and a half ago, I started going to the translational meetings with the basic sciences. Uh, absolutely zero representation from any clinical department. The uh, Department of Surgery is the only person that's, the only group that's actually been there for over a year. So I think with Terry's leadership, to try to bridge what we do in the operating room, try to translate that into innovation, you know, the way we can change surgery in the future, I think is hopefully what we're looking for. This is not a six month plan. It's like your career should be five and 10 year plans. This is something we're headed for in the future. Uh, transplantation has always been the leaders of our innovation here, I think at LSU, and hopefully that'll continue with uh, our, our integration with Willis Knight and our, our research program. Uh, Dr. Lambert, what, how would you recommend, you know, real time for someone who comes to you that's interested in doing research in our current environment and milieu? Yeah, well, I've, I've, I've been meeting individually with, uh, with the residents and the faculty members. I think that uh, I've encouraged that you study common surgical problems. One of the barriers we have is we, there's not an infrastructure in place with multiple labs that have projects that are up and going that spinoffs can be made from. So I think uh, trying to identify a problem that we see uh, a large number of patients with, identify an important clinical question. Uh, is it feasible, the, the, your study? Can you get the answer? Does the answer matter if you can get the answer? And then I think this uh, model of, of pairing up residents with faculty members. Uh, and I think we need to concentrate on clinical and translational type studies to begin with. Uh, I don't think it's gonna change overnight, as you said. Uh, but I don't think there's any reason that ultimately we can't begin to uh, branch out and to uh, ratchet up the quality of the types of studies that we uh, are performing. Well, Nick uh, reached out to some uh, primary basic sciences this year and did his, I was really surprised at his research presentation. I think all of us were like, oh my goodness, this is with Steve Alexander. There wasn't a surgeon's name on this paper. But I would encourage that, reaching out to the, uh, the translational, the basic science, PhDs, if you're truly interested in basics, and, I, and Nick is at Conway, I didn't mean to put him on the spot, but I think it's important for us, you don't have to wait for a mentor, a surgical mentor to, to, to push you. You can independently go to people. All you need is an idea and a plan, and you'd be surprised at what you can reach. Any other questions, comments? Mark and I, when we came back, we worked with Dr. Neil Grande, and they greeted us with open arms. We had several surgery residents actually working in the basic science sections, and it was extremely productive and, and nice. So I agree with, with you to kind of encourage to kind of collaborate more with those guys. Unfortunately, what we have here, because of clinical load is so heavy, Dr. McDonald did everything possible to support us, the only thing he could not do to give us protected time. And he cannot be doing intravital microscopy to look at mice, liver, ischemia, and perfusion, and there is a transplant to be done or run to the yard to take care of acute abdomen. Uh, so you, you are exactly right. Uh, it's expected of you to be a heavy producer of clinical or use. At the same time, you want to be doing basic science. But there is a way and mean with collaboration with our basic scientists. And also, when you get the research appointed to these guys, I think you have to have a very firm deadline. You've got to have each of these guys pick up a topic, pick up a mentor, all like, you know, by middle of August, by middle of September, by end of October. They have to meet this deadline in order for them to be ready to collect the data, at least clinical, to present at ground round, because I promise you, 85% of work done here it was published at national and, and, and regional meeting without any problem whatsoever. Unfortunately, because of clinical load, last several years, things kind of got a little bit shaky at best, especially last year with clinical case presentation being a model for the research. It just would not cut it at major institution. But one last final question, you know, in board examination, they ask these younger ones when you have MEN2. 
has medullary cancer and few chromocyte tumor. You know, what can be done first because that's often asked question in oral examination. Yes, that, Dr. Zabar is absolutely correct. A very frequent question on the, both the written and the oral exams is if you get a patient with MEN2, you need to clearly exclude pheochromocytoma before you operate on their thyroid gland. And if they have a pheo, it should be taken care of first because they can have a hypertensive crisis uh, intraoperatively if they have an unsuspected pheochromocytoma and you try to operate on their thyroid gland. My, one of my mentors, Dr. Jeff Norton, uh, used to say, pheochromocytoma can result in sudden death. Underline sudden, underline death. <laughs> so you need to take out the, you have to test for pheochromocytoma before you do thyroid. Any other questions? Once again, you know, the, the deadlines are there. They're written in your handbook about these research in their farm this year. I, I, I incorporate what Dr. Zabari said. Uh, you have to take time for this. Uh, protected time is the best. Coordination with basic sciences is, is I think, is at the utmost. And there have been several of you come to me that are interested in time in between second, third year, third, and fourth year, even after your postgraduate years to do that. That's what I did. I had some protected time and joined a laboratory of 50 scientists. It's easy to produce papers like that. Going out on your own is much more difficult. So think about those things. ACGME uh, reimbursement is very important to be able to fund these spots. But we have to see a need before we endeavor, push off into this endeavor. Thanks for all your attention and, and for all the great attendance at our conferences. Thank you. Thanks a lot.